The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. morning. And welcome visitors and church family. We are so glad that you're here today. You know, Jehovah Shalom means the Lord is our peace. And peace doesn't mean we don't care, but peace just pushes out the fear. Thank you again for being here. We love you. We're so excited and honored to have Mike Geary in the house today that's going to be giving us our morning sermon. So welcome, Mike. Thank you for being here. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you that you've called us here just as we are, not as we should be. Thank you that you loved us first, that we're not saved by what we do, but that all that we do is in response to your love and kindness to us. Lord, we love you and we love each other and we thank you so much for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for Mike's message, the words of our Lord found in Ephesians, the second chapter, the first 10 verses. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we emerge from a long season of being separated from each other, We now realize that the simple act of gathering with loved ones is something we cannot take for granted. It truly nourishes our souls and is such a pure and godly gift. Jesus loved to gather with people at big celebrations like weddings or smaller gatherings like lunch or dinner. It was at these gatherings that he would minister to folks from every background, from the elite to the sinners, and he would heal and redeem them. At Hour of Power, we care about your journey with Christ and your entry back into the abundance the Lord has to offer when we gather with loved ones. Psalm 36, 7 and 8 says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God! People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Our Savior welcomes each of us to taste His blessings and to drink of His delights. And this is what our power is all about. By helping us take the gospel message around the globe, you enable millions to feast on the wonders of the Lord's goodness from the comfort of their own homes. To help you plan your next gathering and to make your entertaining a little easier, we've created a unique offer just for you. Call, write, or go online today and request the Gather Here Complete Charcuterie Set. Included in this set is a bamboo cutting and display board, a four-piece cheese knife set, and our 40-page charcuterie recipes and tips book called Gather Here, Charcuterie for Family and Friends. We're asking for your gift of just $75 or more for all three items. Friends, your faithfulness to our ministry and your generosity is what makes Hour of Power possible and available to yearning hearts around the world. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now? When the world is crumbling Oh, I, I, I hear you say I hear you say Look up, child Hey, look up, child Hey
Bob Goff is an author, speaker, and professor who wants to see people fully embrace and do life the way Jesus wants us to. He's also the founder of Love Does, a nonprofit organization that supports human rights in some third world countries. His new book, Dream Big, is based off of his Dream Big Framework workshops, which focus on how we can make our dreams a reality. Please welcome Bob Goff. Bob, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks a million. Great to be talking to you, Bobby. You live in California, right? I do. I live in San Diego, and we just bought this camp. It used to be called Oak Bridge, but now it's called the Oaks, and we've been working on it for about seven months. It's been a big dream. That's awesome. I, it's been I, an ambition to create a place. Didn't you do so? I went there? to Oak Ridge. I did. I went to Indian <laughs> Village first, and then I went to Oak Ridge afterwards, all through junior high. I kissed my first girl there on the swing under the oh, tree. Yes, it did. Get out of town. Can I see it? I'm can you, like, turn it around and, and, like, we can see where you are? Oh, yeah. Totally. Come on, get in here. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start scanning. That's awesome. For your initials everywhere. Yeah. That is rad. Every oak tree that has your initials on it. So <laughs> now I know the backstory. That is so cool. So did you, you bought Oak Ridge, didn't you? Yeah, I did. We uh, decided I, uh, my ambition has been to be a grandpa. If I've been since junior high school, since the time you kissed that girl. <laughs> and uh, But I finally became a grandpa. And uh, what I want to do now is just be available. Yeah. And I think um, there's power and availability. And so that's the way it is with ambitions. You just need to know what you want, why you want it, decide what you're going to do about it. Well, that's cool. We're so excited to have you. You have a lot of big fans on the staff here. So many of us, including uh, me, we love your books. Of course, everybody knows your first book, uh, uh, love does and then the second book is it everybody always is that what it's called yeah that's it so, both great great books and you're such a great like storyteller and I, I love how it's I guess it's a nonfiction book but it feels like you get wrapped up in your personal story of how to love people and I just we just love I love the balloon thing you have so many ways that you just bring so much joy and happiness to people's lives well, I think that's what uh, what happens. Jesus said he never spoke to anybody without telling them a story. Yeah. And I know why, because now when I'm walking around here, I'm going to be thinking about your experience at Oak Bridge as a junior high kid. <laughs> and that's what it is. When we talk, I think Jesus, the smartest theologian ever, and he points to two sheep and he says, it's like when one of those gets away. And everybody goes like, I know exactly what that's like. That is so awesome. Yeah, when it happens. <laughs> that's great. You know, uh, one question I wanted to ask you, I want to talk about your new book. Before I do, one thing that always is so interesting to me, I mean, for those of you who don't know you, you're a, you, you were a, an attorney, a professor and stuff, but I think you're really well known more as an author now, I mean, and a speaker, but um, you put your cell phone number at the back of every book you write, which is crazy because you've sold, I mean, you've sold millions of books, haven't you? And, yeah, and people, and it's like your millions. cell phone. So like if somebody buys your book and they flip to the back and they find your cell phone and they call, there's a good chance you're just going to answer and talk to them. What is it's that like? It must be crazy. crazy. Yeah, there was this young guy that called me a little while ago and he said, Bob, I want to know the one thing about relationships. I'm like, you haven't had a girlfriend yet, have you? <laughs> uh, because there's actually many things. It'd be like asking an astronaut, what's the one thing about getting to the moon? It'd be like, I don't know, arrive. But what I would do if I want to get to the moon is I'd find somebody who'd done it before. And I'd spend a ton of time talking about who was in the capsule. And then I would just get the moon in the window and keep pointing at it. So whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, that people want the most, get it in the window. If it's your faith, get it in the window. But you don't, you yeah. can't still do that, right? You don't still answer the phone, do you, when people call? Oh, I do, yeah. You still do? How many calls? You must get tons of calls a day. What about, when do you get time for Bob? I mean, aren't you oh, always? It's crazy. But here's the deal. This would not work for Sweet Maria Goff at all. Yeah. But actually, I just noticed that Jesus was constantly available. Yeah. And that doesn't make me Jesus. It makes me like Jesus. Yeah. And so for we can't decide how tall we'll be or short we'll be. You can't decide how wealthy you'll be, but you can decide how available you'll be. And I just decided to be Uber available yeah. before there was even Uber. Yeah. So <laughs> it's actually been terrific. And, and you I, might say, I, you might say, Maria, your wife, sweet Maria, as you call her in your books, uh, you might say that she maybe isn't called to do that, but maybe you are. She's called to be available in different ways, but this is a way that, I mean, it brings you joy, right? I mean, it's fun for you to yeah. do this. Oh, totally. And the crazy thing, sweet Maria and I, when they said we got married, she finally relented. 
and uh, and uh, they said the two of us will become one. She thought we were going to become her. <laughs> I'm like, oh heck no! But here's the deal: I'm not trying to be like her, and she's not trying to be like me. We're trying to be like Jesus. Amen. And for me, I see His availability, and those are the people that have influenced me the most. It wasn't the smartest people, it was the people who were most available. Amen, that's so good, Bob, thank you. Well, I'm really excited to read your new book. I haven't read it yet, I know it'll be awesome. The first, I read both of your other books and they're just great, they're so fun and encouraging and inspiring. And uh, this is a perfect title for you. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple title, it's called Dream Big. And where did you, what's the book about and where did you come up with this idea to write this book? I mean. This is a crazy time, I, you know I mean? It is, I think uh, so many people are just worn out mm -hmm. that we've been whipsawed. It's gonna take a lot of couch time for us to yeah. sort all this out. But one of the things that will disappear when you're a little stressed out is your ambitions, your dreams. And I just wanna get back to building that rocket ship that was supposed to be your life. Like, yeah. uh, And sometimes you had a dream, let's say it was something that you had a ambition for the first 12 years of your life. And then uh, Billy uh, said no like you applied for the job or you tried for the, the whatever it was that was important to you. And then you feel like you say, God shut the door. It'd be like, that did not happen at all. Billy said, no, that yeah. was the only transaction that happened. So I wanna say, what were your uh, beautiful ambitions? And then ask not what do you want, but just why do you want it? Mm -hmm. Because if you want applause, I mean, join the circus, but if you want Jesus, then find people who are hurting. Yeah. and then have these uh, authentic conversations with them. And in taking an interest in their ambition, you'll actually find your ambition. I, and so this was an ambition of mine. I'm a grandpa now. You know, it's crazy. I've got a grandson. He only knows one word, apple. <laughs> and so an apple is an apple. I'm an apple. Sweet Maria is an apple. A car is an apple. I'm hoping by the time he gets to high school, he knows two words. Um, but I want to find more words to describe the things that you've wanted for a really long time. Don't just say, I want to be happy, because me too. But just say, what would make you happy? Yeah. I mean, really, really, what's going to outlast you? And that's where the good stuff seems to happen. Yeah. When I hear you talking about this, I can think of all of the many people who, you know, grew up in pretty strict religious households. And they have this you know, virtue, and it is a virtue, to be humble, to be, you know, a learner. But sometimes some churches go so far with that that they almost, like, they, it's like it's almost bad to dream. It's bad to, or like you said, even use the phrase, be happy, things like that. There's this religious, uh, 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 I feel like, baggage that a lot of people carry. And they, they get a little like, when they hear a, a Christian, a pastor, or someone like you say, dream big, they're, they're a little bit like, oh, I don't know if that's okay. I mean, what do you say to that as a believer? You know, I mean, I, I'm sure you've experienced that from some folks, right? Oh yeah, I mean, there'll be some pushback because they don't actually know where we're coming from. Like yeah. what happens, I had some big dreams for some little girls in Afghanistan that the Taliban won't let learn how to read and write because they're girls. And that just ticked me off. So instead of signing a petition, I just started buying tickets to Afghanistan. <laughs> so I'm in and out of there constantly. And we've got two schools and we're teaching little girls how to read and write. But here's the thing, and I know you guys get this. God isn't dazzled when you go across the ocean. What blows his hair back is when you go across the street. Yeah. Love God with your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor right here where you are. That's where the good stuff happens. But do it in both places. It isn't binary, and I'm not doing it because I want applause. I want to do it because Matthew 25 said, hungry people, thirsty people, sick people, strange people, naked people, and people in jail. Did you know this? I teach at Pepperdine Law School, but I also teach at San Quentin Penitentiary. You should come with me sometime. I will. It'll blow your mind. I will. <laughs> it's awesome. Wait, yeah, wait the law school or the penitentiary? Just kidding. Come to the penitentiary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a guy got out and he told me that uh, he's standing on the outside of the wall at San Quentin. I'm like, there's not like a trail of bed sheets tied together, right? <laughs> and he, he was holding a phone and he called me. He'd never held a cell phone before. And he said, Bob, I'm out. And I said, in this big moment, I'm like, what are you thinking? And you know what he said? I've got pockets. <laughs> uh. What the heck? Because you can't have pockets. 
in San Quentin in, in a particularly Hem Hemway-esque moment, I told them to be really careful about what you put in your pockets. That's what I would say to people who have big ambitions. Yeah. Sometimes you've carried all the shame and guilt. You got more baggage than Delta Airlines. And I would say, be careful about what you put in your pocket to just let some yeah. of these things go, bring them to Jesus and to say, that's old me. I'm a new creation. I'm new Bob. I've spent 61 long years being old Bob. He's on the bus. New Bob. That's like, great. What slip can I get in with Bobby? That's <laughs> awesome, Bob. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting as a Schuler, you know, we are big dreamers. My grandpa, one of his, my favorite lines from him that I have seen so true in my life is he said, if you build your dream, your dream will build you. And I think there's really something about that, that, that dreaming brings hope and life to people especially now when we're all in this lockdown with COVID-19 and all this despair over the abuse of people of color in America. And, and then on the other side, there's sometimes riots and looting and there's just so much anxiety and worry. It's hard to dream right now. But I think that if we, Amer if we as Americans of all stripes can, can come together and begin dreaming again and become, become that industrialized, visionary kind of people that I think we we're always meant to be, I think that'll make a big difference in people's lives. I think we just call that out of one another. I know you do that. You're calling out from people. You're giving them new names. Yeah. When Peter blow, blew it, Jesus didn't call him a blow it. He said, you're a rock. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to do this whole thing. And so to call that dream back out of you, God gave it to you. Let's dust that thing off. See, so drive it around the block. Amen. Well, the book is called Dream Big, and the author is Bob Goff. And I want to recommend the book is available anywhere books are sold. Go get it today if you need some encouragement. Bob, thank you so much for joining hey, us today. Great to see you. Come on back up here. I will. Thanks again, brother. We appreciate you and enjoy that weather today. All right. See you. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we emerge from a long season of being separated from each other, we now realize that the simple act of gathering with loved ones is something we cannot take for granted. It truly nourishes our souls and is such a pure and godly gift. Jesus loved to gather with people at big celebrations like weddings or smaller gatherings like lunch or dinner. It was at these gatherings that he would minister to folks from every background, from the elite to the sinners, and he would heal and redeem them. At Hour of Power, we care about your journey with Christ and your entry back into the abundance the Lord has to offer when we gather with loved ones. Psalm 36, 7 and 8 says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God! People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Our Savior welcomes each of us to taste His blessings and to drink of His delights. And this is what our power is all about. By helping us take the gospel message around the globe, you enable millions to feast on the wonders of the Lord's goodness from the comfort of their own homes. To help you plan your next gathering and to make your entertaining a little easier, we've created a unique offer just for you. Call, write, or go online today and request the Gather Here Complete Charcuterie Set. Included in this set is a bamboo cutting and display board, a four-piece cheese knife set, and our 40-page charcuterie recipes and tips book called Gather Here, Charcuterie for Family and Friends. We're asking for your gift of just $75 or more for all three items. Friends, your faithfulness to our ministry and your generosity is what makes Hour of Power possible and available to yearning hearts around the world. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. All right, my church family, this is a beautiful Sunday. The sun is shining. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to stand up, and I need you to move with us and celebrate this day. Let's celebrate how good God has been to us this very, very Sunday. Here we go. How was in sin, Jesus took me in. Then a life of heaven filled my soul. He filled my heart with love. He wrote my name up above. Just a little talk with Jesus made it all right. Now let's just have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your love. He will hear your faintest cry and he will answer by and by. When you feel that A little talk with Jesus makes it all right. Oh, my way is sometimes real without an ounce of cheer. But a friend named Jesus is always there. I go to him in prayer. I know he's always there. Just a little talk with Jesus makes that all right. I won't say, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. He will hear your faintest cry. Oh, answer by and by. Oh. When you feel that prayer, 
with Jesus makes that all right. Now let's just have a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. One conversation. Go to the master. Have a little talk with Jesus. Go to talk to Jesus. Well, no matter who you are, we're so glad you're here. Would you stand with us? Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. We're going to say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. We are so excited to welcome our guest speaker today. Mike Erie is a pastor and author who has published five inspirational books. He's pastored several churches here in Orange County, including Mariners, Rock Harbor, and Evie Free Fullerton. Mike currently serves as the teaching pastor at Journey Church in Franklin, Tennessee. He's an amazing preacher. You're going to love this sermon. I want to encourage you to listen to the whole thing. Please welcome with me Mike Erie. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. After that intro, no pressure, right? And I want to thank the one person that clapped initially. Who I don't know who that was, but may Jesus bless you especially this morning. Um, my name is Mike. I'm delighted to be with you. We were out here in Southern California for 20 years. I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, moved back to the Midwest, and we miss so much about Southern California. And, uh, but it's, it's just great to be with you. I wanted to reflect a little bit on the reading that Pastor Chad did from Ephesians, where Paul talks about what was true of us apart from Christ and what's true of us now because of his great mercy. This is something that Paul does throughout his letters. He's very, very intentional about always beginning his letters with the declaration of what Jesus has done uh, for us, for those in Christ, before he ever gets into what we must do in response. Theologians call this pattern the indicative and then the imperative. The indicative, Paul, Paul talks um, in the indicative sense. He's indicating what it is that Jesus has done for us. And you see this, you see this in Romans and Galatians and other places, but you particularly see it in Ephesians. The first three chapters are nothing but Paul indicating what it is that Christ has done. There's only one command, one imperative in the whole section, and that's just the imperative to remember then what Paul does is he will often say, okay, in light of all that Jesus has done, here's what we are invited to do. So the indicative is the first part. The imperative is what we must do in response. And it's super important to notice that order because Paul doesn't reverse it. Moralism says, all right, you must do this in order to receive this. Gospel says, no, no, you've received this. Now, here's how you respond to what it is that you've already received. And so I want to summarize briefly the first three chapters of Ephesians by just highlighting the things that Paul has said about what we used to be apart from Christ 
and what we are now in Christ. So Diane, let's fire up the slides together. Here we go. Apart from Christ, dead in transgressions and sins, following the ways of the world, ruled by the ruler of the kingdom of the air, enslaved to the cravings and desires of our sinful nature, objects of wrath separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God, far away, no identity as a people. In Christ, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing, chosen before the creation of the world. We are saints, we are holy, we are blameless, we're brought near, we're fellow citizens, we're adopted as sons and daughters. We're given grace, we're saved, redeemed, and forgiven. We're the dwelling place of God's spirit. We're members of God's household. We're predestined. We're included in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Recipients of God's lavish grace. Recipients of God's glorious inheritance. Building blocks of God's temple. We're raised with Christ, seated with Christ, alive with Christ. We're God's workmanship. Members of a new humanity. And we all now in Christ have access to the Father. And that sounds like good news, wouldn't you agree? So for three chapters, and this is Paul's normal pattern, he just says, here's what Jesus has done. But he will often give a transition into what we must do that's really important. In, in, in the book of Ephesians, he gives one of his, his best transitions. Uh, the first three chapters are nothing but indicating what Jesus has done, only one command to remember. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul lays one of these transitions on us that really shapes them the rest of the letter. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life, and then what's the text say? What's the next word? Worthy of the calling that you have, what? Received, past tense. So what's the calling we've received? Well, we just, we just read it, right? Sentence after sentence, word after word of what it is that Jesus has done. Then Paul pivots as a prisoner for the Lord. Then I urge you to live a life worthy. Now, this word worthy is really important because you can hear that one of two ways. Worthy could mean, hey, look at all that Jesus did. Be worthy of his sacrifice. Pay it back, if you will. Deserve it or earn it in some way. And I'm reminded of uh, Saving Private Ryan. Have any of you seen that, that movie, Tom Hanks movie years ago? A few of us, my wife, the, the only reason my wife watched it was because Matt Damon was in it. And, um, and that's when we got married. She said there was a resemblance between Matt Damon and, and myself. I'm not going to argue. She also doesn't have very good eyesight, but don't, you know, don't tell her. Um, Tom Hanks plays uh, a captain of a squad of soldiers that come ashore on D-Day. It's just brutally filmed and shot, and it gives you a sense of, oh my goodness, what this must have been like. And after that initial, uh, that initial conflict, they, they kind of enter into, the, um, into France um, more deeply, and they get strange orders. Their job is to go rescue another American soldier and send him home. Turns out this Private Ryan character, played by Matt Damon, um, is the youngest of four sons. The other three sons have died in the war. And so the secretary of the army has said, no, 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 we're not sending another, you know, letter home to mom, announcing the death of her last son. So Tom Hanks' squad was tasked with finding Private Ryan, rescuing him out of the conflict, and sending him home. And if you remember, the, the squad undergoes incredible conflict and tribulation. I think five of them end up dying throughout the course of the movie. And the movie culminates this battle uh, around this bridge. They finally find Matt Damon, Private Ryan. Um, they're trying to rescue him out of this battle. Tom Hanks, the Tom Hanks character gets mortally wounded in the conflict. And I don't know if you remember the scene. It's kind of an amazing scene. As Tom Hanks is dying, he pulls Matt Damon close, the Matt Damon character, and he says, earn this. Earn this. Earn this sacrifice. Five of his men, including himself, have died for this guy. Earn this. And then the story fast forwards. I don't know if you remember, but it's an elderly Private Ryan now standing over the grave of the Tom Hanks character, and he's weeping. 
He turns to his wife and he says, please tell me that I've been a good man. In other words, please tell me that I was worthy of such sacrifice. And you realize, earn it wasn't some invitation to freedom and joy. Earn it kind of hung over his whole life as he was trying to pay back something that could never be repaid. And similarly, sometimes when we hear a word worthy, live a life worthy of the calling you receive, you can hear that in the same sort of saving private Ryan kind of way. Jesus hanging on the cross say, saying, be worthy of this, earn this, deserve this. And thankfully, that is so not what Paul is saying. And we know that because of the word he uses for the word worthy. It's the word axios. I know you were dying to know. But this word is really important. It means corresponding to or fitting to or appropriate to. So the word worthy, like instead of saying live a life paying this back or live a life earning this, Paul says, no, live a life fitting to the calling you've already got. Live a life that corresponds to what's already true of you. Paul uses the same word in Romans when he's writing about Phoebe. He says this, go ahead, Diane. He says, I commend to you, this is Romans 16, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in a city I cannot pronounce. I ask you to receive, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way what? Worthy of his people. In other words, because of your identity as his people and her identity as a servant of the Lord, greet her in a fitting way. Does that make sense? The image isn't Paul, of Paul saying, listen, guys, here's all that Jesus has done. Pay it back as if it were a loan, not a gift. The, issue in, the, the image instead is of, of Paul saying, listen, this is, what all, this is all that you have already. Now live a life that fits it, that's fitting, that corresponds to it. Become, in other words, who you already are. It's already true of you. So live into that reality. Now that's kind of like, okay, great theory. What does that actually mean? Well, it turns out we do this all the time. Like marriage is a great example of this. I got married when I was 29. And I think you'll agree, it's shocking I lasted that long. Right? I mean, we can all agree about that, right? Not a lot of smiles over here. A lot of like, no, I can totally see. I'm shocked you got married at all. I can totally see that. <laughs> Understand, and my wife may rethink her choices every now and again. But married at 29, left the house at 18. So I had 11 years of living a life fitting for a bachelor. And it was glorious. I mean, and, and I don't, I, I know I'm going to get judged for this. It's okay. This is a safe place. But like laundry, all right, I had three piles on the floor. Clean, worn once but wearable, <laughs> and then unclean, if you know what I'm saying. Now the problem was, and I knew it was time to do laundry when there was just one pile. <laughs> that was always a sure sign. But I know some of the ladies are looking at me like, really? Oh, it gets worse. It absolutely gets worse. You know how sometimes when you don't do dishes right away and you let them soak, sometimes there are things that grow? I didn't, I didn't realize that. So every now and again, I would just buy all new pots and pans because I'd let things soak too long. And I thought, oh, you know, okay, that's fine, right? I mean, I lived a life worthy of bachelorhood. I didn't have to check in with anybody. I didn't have to ask permission to anybody. I just lived this sort of selfish life. And then, in July of 2000, I walk into a church, and the pastor looks at me and says, I pronounce you a husband. Now, do I have any idea what it means to be a husband? Ladies? <laughs> nope, not even remotely. But all of a sudden, I am one. And the rest of my married life is spent learning to be the husband I already am. And so the invitation is to put off 
all of those ways of thinking and living and relating that were appropriate to me as a bachelor and put on all those ways of thinking and relating and speaking that are appropriate to me now as a husband. Does that make sense? This is what Paul means when he says, live a life worthy. You've been called and identified as one of Jesus' people. Now live a life according to what's already true of you. Or think about parenthood, for those of you that are parents or grandparents. You, you show up to a hospital as a couple, and you leave with this, <laughs> this beautiful, fragile creature. And you have no idea, right? You have no idea. Yes, a beautiful, fragile creature right here, yes. And we have no idea what to do with you. But the rest of our life is learning to be the parent we already are. See, the image isn't, hey guys, you're saved by grace and then you're on your own. The image is, no, no, grace follows you the whole way because you have it all already, now live up to what's already true. And it's the security of my marriage that allows me to be imperfect. It's the security of my bond with my child that allows me to be imperfect, right? I am a husband, whether or not I'll be a good one is up for debate. I am a father, whether or not I'll be a good one is up to debate, but I cannot get away from that reality. It's true of me no matter what. And so when Paul begins three chapters worth of here's what Jesus has done, and then says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life fitting to that. That's the image he gives us. It's from grace to grace to grace. The most powerful example of this that I've heard of from a, from a friend was uh, a buddy of mine was in grad school studying um, philosophy, I believe it was, at USC, sitting there a very famous Christian named Dallas Willard, who was a philosophy professor at SC. And in his graduate work, my friend was told one day, Dallas came to him and said, listen, I am going to give you an A on the next paper you write. Write a paper worthy of an A. And I, my, when he said that, my jaw hit the floor, I thought of this text, and I was like, so, so could you have just gotten a blank sheet of paper and wrote, to Dallas, love Steve, here's my paper. Would you have still gotten an A? And he said, yeah. The A was guaranteed. I said, but what did you do? Like, how did you approach it? He said, it was the best paper I've ever written. Why? Because I wasn't afraid of being graded. I knew I'd already passed. This, I mean, imagine, imagine the freedom if we actually believed that your life grades out as an A. It, al it already is. It's gonna be in perfect bumps and bruises, hills and valleys, but it's gonna grade out an A. You got an A, so write a paper with your life worthy of the A that you've received. Imagine if we dared to believe that all of this is true, how freely we would love and how freely we would give and how freely we might live life in the face of so much anxiety and fear and turmoil. If Jesus' people actually thought this is the way it works, that God really is for us and not against us, and we just run from grace to grace to grace to more grace, we might actually resemble the Jesus we supposedly follow. Because for me, I still think the old rules apply. Yes, I'm saved by grace, but I've got to do this in order to receive this. That's not the picture Paul paints. You're a spouse, so be the spouse you already are. You're a parent, be the parent you already are. Your paper's already been graded, so write a paper worthy of the grade you've already got. I find that to be good news. I don't know about you. And this is what is so different about the gospel than any other kind of religious system in the world. It's given to us up front in virtue of our association with Jesus, and then it's worked out over time. Not in some earn it and prove it way, but rather in the context of a covenant relationship where yes, there are ups and downs, but progressively I'm looking more and more like what it is that's supposedly true of me. 
But this is hard for us. I, I don't know about you. I can say that I'm beloved of God, or I can hear some of this great theory, but very often I have an inherited identity that's just so at odds with the words that I hear from Jesus. You know, maybe I was the, the rebellious kid way back when, or maybe I was the successful kid and the workaholic kid, or maybe I was uh, the sports person or whatever it is from coaches and parents and siblings and spouses. We kind of have an inherited identity that we live into and live out. And part of the work of Jesus is the putting off of that old self and putting on the new, right? Paul himself says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation has come. So we might be able to hear all of this but it's kind of hard for us to really believe. That's why Paul speaks of salvation in three tenses. He never just speaks of being saved. Go ahead, Diane, if you would. Notice he speaks of it in all three tenses. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we what? We'll be saved. Why is that? Because it's true, but we're slowly working it out. So for us, as recipients of this grace, there should be this incredible permission and joy to live a life worthy of the A, but also as we do this as a community, who are we as grace recipients to sit in judgment of other people who are receiving grace themselves? That's one of the hardest things about grace. Grace levels us. It's hard to judge people when you're operating on grace, right? just like everybody else is. I mean, and saints, the old saying is, burn grace like cars burn gasoline. If you've ever been to a, um, a support group, a 12-step group, one of the things that people find so compelling about them is they know what waits for them when they show up. And that's grace and understanding. Honesty, yes, of course. But people who have been there and get it, and so often, in the world, the church of Jesus isn't known for the grace that we've claimed for ourselves, but restrict then to who else can receive it. So the invitation of Jesus, the invitation of Paul is not just to become what's already true of us, but to give people space in their lives to do it too. That's the much harder bit. And so for us, maybe you've heard this, maybe this is super familiar, but there's a sense in which we have to have a, a kind of view of the Father and his relationship to us that's different often than the one I've typically thought of. Because God, in this view, is loving us into our future, gracing us into our future. And, and as he's doing that, he's patiently with us as we, in fits and starts, try to grow into what's already true. Years ago, acquaintances of ours adopted a child from the foster care system. And that child, they noticed after a couple of weeks, they would find in the child's bedroom little stashes of food in, in, in bags under the mattress, under the bed, behind the curtains, just little bitty stashes of food. And obviously they were very puzzled by this. And initially, the child didn't want to say anything about why that was the case. But after weeks and months went by, they discovered the reason this kid hid food was because his biological parents would uh, punish him by starving him over the course of a weekend by locking him in his room without food for a weekend. And so kids are resilient, right? And so what did he learn to do? hide food in his room. It was a matter of survival. And so, of course, when he arrives into a new family, what's the thing that's most natural? To do the same thing. Now imagine you're the father or mother who has adopted this child into your home. What are your feelings towards this child? Are you angry at the child for hiding food? Are you? Boy, not at all. I mean, if there's anger, it's probably towards the biological parents who would punish a kid this way. 
But what are your emotions towards this kid? I would imagine compassion, understanding. I get why you do that. And if you were the adoptive mother or father, what would you say to this child? What would you say? I mean, I can imagine saying something like, listen, my son, this family is not like your old family. We will never, ever starve you. You, do n- you never have to hide food. Wouldn't we all say that? And do you think that child would believe it right away? <laughs> no way. No way. Those are just words. So as a parent, what do you have to do in that moment? Three meals plus stacks every day. Day after day after day after weeks after weeks and months and years. How many meals do you think you have to provide? How many errors does the child have to make before he realizes he's not going to be punished that way anymore? How much time does growing into being a part of a new family take? And I just find that such a fitting picture of what it is that we're talking about here in Ephesians. That the father looks at us still hiding food. It doesn't matter if we follow Jesus for three months or for 30 years. We're still afraid. We're still using crutches. We're still operating in a world with scarcity at the forefront of our minds. We're hiding food. And I imagine the father looking at us the way you might look at that adoptive kid. You don't have to hide food anymore. I, I will provide for you. But do we believe it? Not a first. And so how many times do we come to the Lord's table? How many times do we sing songs that he is good? How many times do we see him answer prayer? How many times does the community gather to testify to his goodness? How many meals must we have until we get to the place where we dare to believe the good news is actually this good? That your life has graded out and you're safe. There's no condemnation. God is for you. I know we know all the words, but imagine being that little kid learning, I don't have to hide food anymore. And that, friends, is what Christ invites us into. Hallelujah for salvation in heaven. Hallelujah for forgiveness of sins. But even now, his salvation presses into us and works its way out so that we might live the A we've already got. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we bless you and we ask for the courage and grace to believe that you're this good. Not as some matter of religious cliche or abstract theology, but to the depths of us that we might believe that grace awaits us every step of the way. Father, we pray that you would give us courage to put away all the ways that we cope and manage life and to put off all of those ways of living and acting that are appropriate for people who don't worship you that we might put on the ways of living and acting and being in the world that are fitting. But we need your help, we need your grace. We pray that we would become a community that just looks and acts and talks like Jesus of Nazareth. Not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the world. Because it's in the name of Jesus our Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so very much. The preceding program was made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you, and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.